Thank you, Juan, for an excellent and thought-provoking keynote. Uh, we're moving on to the second last panel of the afternoon. Can I remind you to download the RMNet Beirut 2018 app? You can connect with any of the speakers there and you can keep track of, uh, of if we're keeping track of time, and you can keep track of all the, the talks that are coming up. Uh, so now we move on to a panel that's going to look at angel investing and early stage support networks. Uh, the hosts on this panel are the most active angel investors in the region, and they're going to explore the challenges of working with early stage companies and what ecosystem uh, is necessary to support it. Uh, please welcome to the stage the moderator, Malik Hamoud, Group Executive Director of Zain Kuwait. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for hosting us. It's really a pleasure to be part of ArabNet. Uh, I'm uh, Malik Hamoud. I'm part of Zen Group and the Chief Strategy Officer of Zen Group in Kuwait. And basically, I'm in charge of everything that's around the digital world, investments, business development. And today in the telecom industry, it's all about how to monetize data and how to leverage on what we have. So let's start with the interesting stuff, angel investing. So the new world is all about startups and technology, and the riskiest part of the, the whole supply chain is basically angel investing. Uh, so uh, let's start with, uh, uh, we have a very interesting audience, uh, panel here today. Uh, the beauty of the panel that we're hosting today here is we have the largest market in the region, Egypt, a very young market, and Ma'an here is here, uh, Khalid is here today to speak about the Egyptian market. <clears throat> The second market is the richest market in the region uh, with KSA, and we have here Ma'an to, to, to talk about it. And finally, we have Dr. Rohana to speak about the Lebanese market. So let's start with our first guest, Mr. Khalid. Khalid, uh, I'll, I'll make a brief introduction about Khalid, and please, you can take it from there. So Khalid is basically the chairman of Him Angel. It's a $5 million angel investment fund in Egypt. Uh, Khalid started his uh, basically in angel investment uh, career in 2012 with the KI Angels. So before we go into the future and why are we doing this, can you please tell us about uh, a bit more about KI Angel, how you started 2012, and how you moved into Him Angel recently? Um, very briefly, I, I, I used to be a serial entrepreneur for 20 years between 1991 and 2011. I started up seven companies, uh, two failed, three exited breaking even, one exited with a decent success and one exited with a big success. So that was the portfolio I managed to uh, start and end over 20 years. Uh, and over 20 years, you don't get younger. So I decided uh, after the last good big exit to invest some of that money in something useful. Philanthropic was my initial idea. Uh, and I never thought I would do what I'm doing now. But anyway, I, I failed in doing proper philanthropy, philanthropy because I didn't understand it very well. I said what I understand is starting up companies but instead of doing it myself, let me help the next generation startup companies. So I set up KI Angel as a not-for-profit fund. I put some money into it and started helping companies to grow and, uh, and, and mentor them, handhold, and some of them were really very successful. Um, and over time, I received many requests from people I know, why can't we invest with you and so on. I say, I don't invest for profit. I want this, this to be sustainable. I want it to make profit, but I don't want to earn any profit. 
and I don't want to take your money in a not-for-profit organization. Until finally, there was so much pressure that convinced me to start another fund, which is Him Angel, uh, uh, and make it for profit, uh, so I can take the money of people who want to invest and continue investing it in startups uh, in Egypt and so on. Over the last six years, I've invested in about uh, uh, 19 companies, uh, two failed, two exited already, and the rest is in the pipeline. It's still growing. Most of the rest has raised money more than once um, with very or better valuations than the one I entered at. Uh, it is a risky business to be an angel um, because you're at the infancy of any company where everything is unknown, even the people themselves. You meet them once, twice, three times, but you really get to know people only when you interact with them for longer periods, during ups and downs, and during different phases. So when you decide to invest, and, uh, and my fund is actually very well known, at least in Egypt, to be the quickest fund. So from the time I meet in a startup to the time I give go, no go, it's typically two weeks. And then another week, simple term sheet, money is in the bank. So that is my rule of, of working with startups because they cannot really afford waiting for six months, complex term sheets, all of that. I think it's unfair to them. They have enough of things to worry about than to worry also about their investors. So as we are called angels, we should really act as angels. I see that terminology sometimes being abused, but I also see angels behaving like, you know, very experienced venture capitalists, and we're not. We should not be. We should be angels. So that's my story. Thank you. So you mentioned 19 or 90 companies that you... Uh, 19 invested? companies One so nine. far, yeah. Okay. My aim is to reach 100, if you want to see my vision is to reach 100 successful companies in Egypt. Whether I can manage to do that or not, I don't know. It's definitely the risky part, as you've said. And uh, the beauty of, of uh, angel investing is that you take the idea, you take the people owning the idea, and you have to, move, to transform them into what we call the MVP and really take it to the next level. But the reward, if you, if you do it right, is, is quite uh, excellent. So let's move to uh, Ma'an. Thank you, Man. Uh, so uh, you come from the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, you've been a banker for most of your career. Uh, let me take you briefly through the CV of Man. quite a CV actually. So he's been a private banker at Coots. Coots is the wealth management unit of uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland. Before that, he was with Citibank in Geneva. And you worked in Dubai as well. And you worked also with the Saab, which is basically the HSBC of, of KSA. So first question, uh, I'm an ex-banker as well, so I'll ask you a question. Why did you make the move from banking, very structured industry, traditional uh, promotion process and very stable career to angel investing where basically all the action is and it's very unstable? Thank you very much for having me. Taban, to answer your question is technology, disruptive technology, disruptive the way we do business as a uh, the way we operate as banks and the way we do business. So, so technology disrupted how we do business. So I decided to I get a lot of calls from friends and families that are looking to invest in new technologies. Our, the mic. Our, okay. Our clients from the banks, they ask for to invest in early stage technology. Yeah, that's better. So I wanted to be part of the ecosystem building. I want to be part of the new technology, the change, the things that are disrupting the way we do business at the banks. And especially in Saudi Arabia, you know, it's a growing market and it's a relatively new young market. So I wanted to be part of it. So I came back to, you know, to, to this exciting uh, new. And now let me ask you the same question. Okay. Since you're a banker, why did you leave bank? Interesting. Well, same fear as you. Uh, I've spent 15 years in the world of banking. I just moved a year ago. And for similar reasons, actually. One, banking, despite being a, a very good industry, yeah. uh, it's very traditional. It's uh, heavy. And when we used to raise issues about fintech and let's do this, let's do that, it was always, no, 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 no. It's not yeah. ours. We're bigger. We can eat them. We can do whatever we want. So we'll do it in-house. 
And the second thing, when we used to bring young companies to finance them or to work with them, it was always, uh, no, no, we don't want to do that. It's too risky for us. So that's one of the one, and the passion, of course. Uh, okay, I, I love this. Sure. I love uh, the energy that the youngsters and these stars have, and it's yeah. really the future. So it's kind of bridging the way to the future, and hopefully it will be the right decision. So just uh, since uh, we haven't spoke about your cur current career, you're currently uh, with uh, Venture Souk. Can you tell us about a bit about, a bit about uh, Venture Souk? Yeah. So Venture Souk is an equity funding platform. We we, uh, we source our own deals, we get a number of transactions, we source the deals, we do our due diligence in-house, and then we package these companies and we invest our own uh, funding as partners. Plus, we, we're an angel syndicate, so we bring other investors to co-invest with us under one umbrella managed by us. So and you're covering the Saudi market only? We're How covering the MENA market. Okay. Uh, so basically, we invest in disruptive technologies. Anything that is disrupting the market, mm -hmm. whether it be it from the U.S. or from Lebanon or Egypt or Saudi, doesn't matter. So you've made investments outside of the kingdom. Yes, we made 24. We invested in 24 companies, uh, 28 rounds. Um, companies in Africa, in uh, Saudi Arabia. Currently, we're leading a Series A round for the largest startup in Saudi Arabia. I'm not going to say the name now. We need to sign first. But we're leading that $4 million round. But you're in the, at the angel level or you're a bit higher than the angel level? And what's your, usually your ticket size? What do you look okay. for? Okay. So Adventure Soup, we changed the, the nature of the in investors. Because um, outside of Saudi Arabia, angels would do out of Dubai or any other countries would invest in the range of fifteen to $25,000 per investment per individual. Okay. That's in fine. Saudi Arabia, that ticket size went up a little bit between 50 to 100 okay. per individual uh, angel investor. And then what happened is we get a lot of requests from corporate clients, institutions, to source deals for them at a higher, like half a million or a million dollar ticket. So it's really in Saudi, it's angel plus. So you're doing both the angel and the VC? We're doing C, then A, and sometimes series B, depending on the client. Excellent. Yeah. Let's move to our third uh, speaker uh, this afternoon, Dr. Uh, Nicolai Wahana. So you are basically the, uh, you have, have an amazing CV to be honest, I'm, I'm gonna go through it. You're currently the general manager of IM Capital. Uh, you were previously the executive director of Beritech. So Beritech is basically a, a platform where we fund and we support the startup uh, uh, sector. You are a lecturer at uh, ESG, OZIB, basically. You're a board member at the ISOC Lebanon chapter. You're a board member at Beritech, Lebanon Internet Center. You're a certified business incubator trainer from InfoDev. Not bad. Did I, did I miss anything? <laughs> so, uh, tell us a bit more about yourself. So, it's basically you pretty much everywhere. So, can you tell us a bit about yourself and what you're doing at IM Capital and what's your view on the local market in, in, uh, in a few words? Now, if I want to talk about myself, a few words. <laughs> so, uh, just uh, thanks uh, for this intro, Malik. Uh, not to disappoint everyone, but these guys are angels. I, I'm not an angel, I, I'm the devil. But actually, I'm, 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 a, I'm a maker of angels, and I'll tell you uh, how in a moment. So, uh, if you heard correctly uh, the intro, so currently, uh, I will go through my previous lives, but currently I, I manage IM Capital, which is a, uh, a program, or a VC uh, type of program uh, that is funded under uh, USAID, uh, MENA Investment Initiative. And the idea behind uh, this fund, this program that was launched in 2015, is to uh, get or help access for to early stage uh, investments. So any any for early stage businesses. So we play around the early uh, stages of the life cycle of a uh, of a company. Uh, and and so here, I mean, tickets are uh, are a bit you know intermediary. They go up to like five hundred thousand dollars or less and where it's more risky than later stage financing. And when we started, we noticed a gap in this uh, funding life cycle in Lebanon, in the, in the market, current market, which was angel investing. 
And uh, so, and this is very important in any landscape or any ecosystem around the world, uh, where you have angel networks, you know, like were described by my, my colleagues. And it was practically inexistent in Lebanon, you know, a structured approach or a network of, of business angels where there are individuals that use and risk their own money at the very early stage of uh, uh, any, any startup, and which is pretty much needed at this stage. And if you look at any, any startup, any, and, and this is by experience, you look at their uh, cap table or their shareholders or their backers, they're mostly angels, they're pri private individuals, they're either friends and family or, you know, or, or, or angels. So this is key, this is key to finding the, the, your, your first investors or your first believers in, in, in your ideas. So before you are actually become VC ready and be able to pitch to structured venture capitalists and, and bigger, bigger, bigger funds. So this is key and it was missing. I mean, we hear that business angels are high net worth individuals that use their own money and they do exist in Lebanon. I mean, you know people that know people that have, have money and, 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 and time to, to invest. But I mean, there's so much they can do and there are not that many. So we, we said, fine, we have to come up with a, a, a network or a structured way of, of uh, getting uh, angel investing and, and, uh, in, in the Beirut and Lebanese ecosystem, which was missing. So uh, we said we want to be, so create angels, you know, and, and, and we want to do it by crowd, crowdsourcing the, the angels. You know, the high net worth individuals are well known, but we don't want to target those. We want to, you know, create a new breed, a new, a de democratize angel investing and make it accessible to anyone. Anyone in this room can become an angel uh, investor. So we came up with a program that does that, democratize angel investing, make it accessible to anyone, and uh, because all of you are here for a reason, because you're interested in the startup, you're interested in the ecosystem, you're interested, you, you know what's going on, there's a buzz, and you want to be part of it. So we're giving you access to be part of this vibrant ecosystem by actually investing in it with small amounts of money and carrying a, a whole portfolio, uh, but you don't know how. So we came up with a program called MBA, uh, so a master class for business angels. So we take a class of 25 individuals and we take them through a process, a methodology of learning how to uh, become angel investing and actually investing the, the money and making money out of this, this MBA uh, program. So it's a, it's a nine, nine month uh, program that starts from September to, to July, where every six weeks we get this, this class together and they, they listen to pitches, pretty much like you listen today, Three, three to four pitches that are curated and, and well uh, presented and, and, and pre-screened by us. And then the angels among themselves, you know, they're debriefed, they do, they, there's a coach that takes you through the process of uh, asking the right questions, you know, and you want to uh, follow up with this, etc. Then there is a due diligence and there's a voting process where the angels actually uh, decide to invest or not. And so uh, each, each, and the entry ticket is like $15,000 for this MBA, which is a, a, a nice amount, you know, accessible amount for anyone that is interested in that. So you will put them in a pool. This class has like 25 potential angels, you know, and they pay 20, uh, 15K. So we have like around $400,000 of money to invest in startups. So now this class, at the end of it, you, can, you invest in three to four companies. So you have a portfolio. You learned how to invest. And then now you can start helping the companies because angel investing is not just about the money, it's just about giving money and smart money. So you have to uh, give, give time and, and your resources to help the company grow as well. Uh, and carrying a portfolio is less risky. And what we do as well at IAM Capital, on top of all of this uh, learn and earning uh, uh, possibilities, we guarantee 50% of the, uh, the investment uh, of, the, of the angel. So there is really, really low risk, and we were able to lower the risk of, of entry for anyone that wants to become a, an angel investment investor. So we, we, we currently run three groups. So we have three classes of up to 25 indiv individuals. So we have a community now of 70 new, 75 uh, new business angels in the uh, local ecosystem. And one of them is a woman only uh, angel group. So we have 20, a class of 23 women called Elwaf, Lebanese Women Angel Fund, that invest uh, only for women-led ventures. So this is a way of empowering, uh, empowering again uh, women through, uh, uh, through uh, this, this type of, of angel investing. And they can do it, by the way, in any sector. So not just tech. Uh, so again, you can have a portfolio of not a sector-specific uh, type of, uh, of approach. And we run these classes every, every September, and this is how we're going to democratize and make accessible uh, business angel investing 
uh, to, to anyone. And so far, we've collected more than 1.5 million uh, of, of, uh, of, I mean, personal money from coming from those business angels that were in these, these MBAs. And they've invested, the first class invested in four startups. So, I mean, I can go on and go on, but I mean, you get the idea. I have a question about the program set. So where is the program held here in Beirut? Yes, it's in Beirut. And when you look at, at uh, the participants, you're talking what kind of age group, what kind of background is it? Uh, personal people coming in for the interest of doing it, or it's institutional, family offices. How does it work? No, no, it's 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 personal. It's personal. each one coming. Yeah, yeah. And so it's anyone can age groups. anyone can apply. Anyone can apply. So please visit our booth and uh, give us your business cards for the next class that will start in in, in September. I have one comment actually. You mentioned smart money, uh, and. I hope that we all concur on that, but from our perspective, since we've been doing lots of investments, our advice to all startups, or uh, even if you're at the angel level, if you are at the Series A, Series B, always look for smart money. It's easy to go invite somebody with money, like a family office, they can put a financial investment, you'll be happy because they don't ask too many questions. But for you really to take the business to the next level, so for example, if you're based in Lebanon or Egypt and you go to the region, always look for the right investor that will come in with the smart money and the know-how to take you to the next level. Going back to um, Khalid, so uh, can you tell us about the um, ecosystem in Egypt? Uh, we had a side discussion uh, half an hour ago around uh, expectations and we need to set expectations and unfortunately what we've seen in the region uh, is valuations have gone up in some markets more than other markets, even for startups and that's basically pushing away or uh, smart money is really just shying away because we don't want to do, let's call them stupid deals. Uh, so can you tell us a bit more about where is the digital market do, uh, What's happening there? What kind of valuation are you talking about? So can you, have, can you start something with, I don't know, 10, 15, 50, 100,000 dollars? Because we know for a fact that in the GCC for KSA or UAE, just the hiring and, and everything is a bit more expensive. So how does it work in Egypt? Uh, I will answer the question. I just wanted to have a comment on, on, on angel investment in general, not just Egypt, in the region, that it's really way underfunded. If you look yes. at angel investment in Europe or in the U.S., it's typically 50% of the total amount invested in venture capital is angel level. The other 50% is Fully Series agree. A and above. In the Middle East, it's below 15%. So why am I mentioning that? Because it addresses a point you made, which is the inflation in valuations. If you don't have a healthy angel investment ecosystem, what winds up happening is you dry out your, your pipeline for the VCs. They start fighting for them. Every VC still wants yeah. to invest, so they inflate the valuations. And I see that all over the place, more so, of course, in Lebanon and in Dubai, but also in other places. Egypt is lagging behind in that inflation a little bit, which is good for us as investors. It's not inflated that much uh, yet, but the scarcity will lead to inflation. So if there aren't enough angel investors all over the Arab world willing to put the $100,000, $200,000 ticket first, what winds up happening is you have fewer good companies and everybody's fighting for them. In Egypt, we've seen two phases. I have to divide them, three phases. Pre-2011, where individual startups like the ones I started or many others were working, you know, in vacuum. Everybody with good intentions, with whatever he learned or she learned, uh, living abroad for a while, etc. So it was based on, you know, individual efforts, good intentions, no ecosystem. Starting 2011, we saw a hype where everybody was jumping into entrepreneurship, including the ecosystem, universities, support organizations, Endeavor, in jazz, just name it. Everybody was jumping uh, the wagon of entrepreneurship, which gave it a very good hype. But the quality of the startups was, was more of a hype than reality. So the majority were just fresh out of college. I cannot find a job, let me become an entrepreneur. And I always say that entrepreneurship is not a replacement for a job. 
and I invest an average of one a month. So basically, every 20 companies I see, I invest in one of them. It's a healthy pipeline. The quality is, is, is better. Valuations are decent so far. Uh, but I'm expecting that what happened in Lebanon and in Dubai and a little bit in Jordan is going to come also to Egypt, which is the inflation, unless we can have, you know, $100 million per year at least in Egypt for angel investment. Today we only have maybe seven or eight, which is too little. And that's the uh, big dilemma that we have between supply and demand, the quality of the supply of startup that we're seeing. Are there any government initiatives in Egypt? Because we know here that uh, the central bank is a big sponsor of what's happening. Uh, we know that there are similar initiatives in most of the countries in the region. What about Egypt? What's happening uh, from, from a uh, government perspective? First of all, in my humble opinion, government should not interfere with this. I think government interference, even with good intentions, will distort the market. So we've seen it in Lebanon. Uh, I, I have to be very honest. We we'll have a chat on that. Uh, we've that. seen it all over where governments intervene, that governments, you know, can distort the market. Cheap money in, in, in venture capital is not good. It's unhealthy to give more money than people want or need. It has to be really based on, on well-studied uh, opportunities, etc. Uh, in Egypt, the government also makes a common mistake, which is it starts doing its own. So it has now an incubator. It has a venture capital arm. Uh, it's, it's competing with us, basically, in the market, which it shouldn't. It should just help regulate, uh, entice. But I'm totally against governments uh, in any shape or form putting money into the ecosystem. The money should come naturally for wise investors or wise LPs uh, 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 convinced of the opportunity rather than anything else. If you, again, if we, if we play the devil's advocate here, the government is trying to stimulate the economy to create jobs by pushing entrepreneurs and the whole startup uh, environment. So, this is really a big debate that we could have. But again, yeah, I agree. I fully agree. The government role is really to set regulation to, and we heard it this morning from, from the Prime Minister opening speech, that we need to change the laws, we need to prepare the economy to be more adaptable and easier to do business in. Man, what about the kingdom? So, same kind of approach. What's happening right. there on the ground? We know the government has big initiatives. There's the yeah. big vision of 2030. So, what's happening at the uh, ecosystem of entrepreneurs? And, 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 yeah, uh, again, again, the government is supporting the ecosystem and the entrepreneurship. And we have, uh, they have certain initiatives. Um, they do invest. What's this is interesting, and uh, to Khalid's point is that. Um, they do matching schemes. So basically, they would give $100,000 to a qualified startup, and then they go out to the private sector and match it from angel investment. How would they define the qualified startup? Is uh, there a scorecard? How does it work? Um, the government, they use, they don't have their own house, uh, in-house system, mm -hmm. rating system, where they do it, and sometimes they rely on outside. And, um, consultants like us or companies from outside, but they do have their own system, which basically uh, traction, uh, management, uh, the opportunity itself. And, the and where do you come into the picture when it comes to supporting these initiatives? See, we work with the government on certain initiatives. One of them is the soft landing program, okay. which they have introduced recently. So basically, they have something called the entrepreneurship license. So non-Saudi companies could apply to the program, and if they're qualified, then they could come. Uh, to, they could take the entrepreneurship license through SAGIA, the Saudi Arabian General Investment Authority, mm -hmm. and they pay like a small amount, and then they come to the country, and the government will give them offices and and certain logistics support on the ground. They don't take equity in return on in kind or anything like that. Okay. So that's, that's something we work with the government because we invest in U.S. companies and Egyptian companies in Lebanon. So we would introduce the companies to the government and say these are good companies that could come to Saudi and share the knowledge and basically create jobs, which is part of the 2030 vision. So basically we can say that there is kind of, of a an open mindedness in terms of 
receiving new ideas, new startups from the region, yes. and hosting them in, K in KSA. Yes, because KSA is the largest market in the region. Exactly. You know what I mean? And, and also, it's the hardest market to play, to penetrate. Uh, for outsiders, it's very difficult for startups from the region to go and penetrate the Saudi market. Uh, so now they're introducing these initiatives to make it easier for them to come to the Saudi market and share the knowledge. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So that's a good message for everyone. Yeah. Anyone who has who wants to expand to KSA, <laughs> this is the man to talk to. Actually, Badr is also it's an incubator backed okay. by the government. If you go to Badr.com and then you can apply for the soft landing program. And if they don't reply to your email, you can come to me and I'll push it. I think your way would be much <laughs> easier and faster. Uh, the circular 331 of BDL is not government. It's the central bank and it's private sector. So luckily, it's private initiative and not government initiative because it wouldn't have seen the light if it were from the government and waiting from some council of ministers to, or, or parliament to, to move forward with it. So it is uh, coming from the private sector. And it is led and it came to be in August 2013, after years of lobbying with the central bank governor from the ecosystem. So it's a bottom-up approach that uh, was, uh, that ended up with this circular that through unleashed half a billion dollar overnight uh, in the local ecosystem coming from, from banks. But it was very well studied and the financial engineering is, is, is great. And they called it banking outside the box. And it was a model that really Everyone around the, the region and, and the world was looking at uh, how, how come this, was, this happened. So it unleashed half a billion dollars uh, of, of uh, money into the tech uh, sector and but, uh, through the banks, by the way, through the banks, which, by the way, it's not their job, you know, to go into uh, VC and, and take equity. But uh, what happened is that funds were created as intermediary to use the, 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 uh, the money from the uh, banks and invest. And so, hence, the governance and the uh, decision making is typical VC, you know, and, and the valuation are very well studied, and there are investment committees and management committees, etc. So, they are, even though they were guaranteed at 75%, but, you know, the, the structure and the governance is purely run as a VC because uh, the risk is still on the, on the VC, you know, and they have to carry portfolio. And so, and the fund managers, by the way, are experienced people. So you take all the funds, you know, uh, if you go around some of the booths here, you see that they, ha they are really professionals, you know. So, uh, I mean, maybe you can find like a couple of maybe wow, wow un uncomprehensible variations, but it's not the case, you know, generally. And, and it's, we rarely find, uh, find this. So, I'm not worried about nor inflation nor over money, et cetera. And what happened as well through the Circular 331 is not just funds were created, but again, there is another initiative through the Circular 331 to create accelerators and, you know, boot camps and early stage uh, programs that will feed into these uh, funds and to create, you know, startups and to create the deal flow for this, these uh, VCs that were created through the Circular 331. Uh, just to have more deflow, more, more supply, I mean, then there is, uh, I mean, more demand than there is supply of, of, uh, of capital, as, as uh, Khaled uh, mentioned. So, uh, so over the years, we've seen, uh, you know, this, I mean, this market self-regulated, you know, all, all the VCs have found their place uh, in this uh, ecosystem. You know, we've, we're, we're starting to see, you know, structured and thematic funds, you know, fashion uh, funds or technology funds or, 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 you know, very, very thematic and, and they're trying to, to find their way, uh, I mean, at their place in this, in this landscape so there will not be lots of overlapping, you know, uh, through this, uh, this, uh, this approach. So I'm, I'm very, I mean, very positive. I mean, of course, there's always a flip side to, to anything, you know, the, 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 the glass could be half full or half empty. It depends how we look at it. But I think overall, there are more advantages and disadvantages in this, in this uh, uh, circular uh, 331 and initiatives because as you can see around you, I mean, lots of those funds or initiatives were not there pre-circular 331. So, I mean, uh, this has really leapfrogged the ecosystem uh, in, in Lebanon and created this, uh, this buzz and all this hype and all these new startups and new jobs and, and uh, new products and new ideas and, and all these pitches, etc. That, that were there. And, and by the way, just to tell you that it's not enough. I mean, the Circular City Throne will not solve all the problems that there are out there. I mean, they are, they've unleashed capital, you know, at, at 
later stage uh, in a life cycle of a company. Uh, they have, you know, created uh, several early stage, uh, uh, I mean, accelerators and boot camps, what have you, but they're still missing. And that's why, example, I am Capital, we've created this angel uh, groups, we've created, you know, uh, we've co-funded accelerators, etc., so that we fill, there's still uh, stuff to be done, you know, so, and we're trying to fill equity gaps as we move along uh, this, this and, and trying to, to, to construct all these this pieces in this landscape. I definitely agree with what uh, I'm personally a big fan of Cithion. I think it, it was uh, the best thing that we had in the last few years in Lebanon because it really created a hope for lots of the entrepreneurs who weren't able to access capital to have access to capital and really grow businesses. And we, we have a few success stories so far. But going back on Khalid's comment, he mentioned that the problem in our region, and I fully agree, is that angel money is very rare. It's almost, it doesn't exist. Uh, don't you think that what we've seen after 331, especially after the establishment of the VCs, most of the focus was on past seed, Series A, the angel, and you mentioned it, that we need to have more and more in terms of boot camp, accelerators, prepare people, but the money wasn't there. So what do you, what do you think about that? Do you see lots of angel money coming in, or it's still very uh, small? It's for me or for Khaled? Yeah, it's um, both for, for, uh, for, for, actually for you. Yeah. Uh, so, as I described in my, uh, when I answered your first question about the program that we came up with, uh, I mean, you'd be surprised, it was, I mean, because of this uh, ecosystem leapfrog, as I said, you know, and people wanted to, uh, to invest and look more and are interested in, in all these startups that are coming in and want to be part of it but don't know how, so uh, I, I, saw, I, I mean, I'm very positive and we were able to, as I said, I mean, okay, okay, there are these high net worth individuals wh where they give individual tickets of $400,000, but they're not that much, you know, not, that, not many in, in any ecosystem anyway. So usually tickets are small. And, and you know, uh, so small tickets are like in 15 or 20K. It's like, I mean, you can go into one startup, but I mean, or, or you just gather two or three angels and you go in in a, in a much bigger ticket. This, this happens in, yeah, in syndicated. In, sorry? You mainly see friends and families coming to that games, but you don't have yeah, yeah. I mean, money yeah, coming in. Friends and family and yeah. fools and the angels, etc. So they're all in the same, in the same pot. But, but as I said, I mean, uh, angel, uh, and as I said, the, the, uh, the, the approach that we took is really to make it accessible to, to anyone and to crowdsource, you know, uh, angel uh, investment. Okay. And not just, you know, having uh, uh, one angel with a big ticket, we have several angels, small tickets, and coming together with this big ticket. So this is the approach that we took. And you'd be surprised, as I said, I mean, in, in less, in, in a year and a half, we had three groups, 70 angels in the community, and we were able to raise like $1.5 million available as angel investing for the ecosystem. And this is money outside 331, you know, so I think it's, it's, it's a good number to start with. Uh, uh, we don't have a benchmark anyways to, uh, locally to see if it's good or bad, but I think it's a, it's a good start that we can leverage and build upon and, and grow this uh, over the years. Actually, I want to share an experience that we're, uh, a program that we have launched recently with Touch here in Lebanon in coordination with ArabNet, and we thank ArabNet for the support. So we've created what we call the Touch Innovation Program, which is basically an initiative with ArabNet to basically incubate and accelerate up to six uh, startups uh, for a period of six months. We take them through the whole process and then we, li we literally go and pitch investors to come in and invest in because these guys are ready and we're very, we've been very selective. So in last, I think we started the program a couple of weeks ago. We already have over 16 applications and it's really uh, coming up. So we're very proud of that. What do you take in return for that? Nothing. Uh, uh, so are we were very happy with that as well. Yeah, so we, we, <laughs> should, we, should, we should speak afterward. <laughs> Thank you. Another, another topic that is very critical when you, go, when you look at the supply and demand, and uh, I'm going to share another uh, experience that we faced at, as, as, a, as, a, as a Zen group. So we invested, we have invested in the region and pretty much, so we've done investments in the Middle East, uh, we've done investments in Eastern Europe, we've done investments in the US. Uh, and what we've noticed in this region is most of the startups and the companies that are hot, basically, and the VCs are investing in these companies are always looking at the B2C component. So it's always about we go, we can try to take pennies or dollars or cents from, from the pocket of the consumer. When we looked, started looking at the portfolios of investments in our VCs in Eastern Europe, we noticed that the approach is kind of different. VC money is going more and more into B2B platforms, advanced tech, and these people are, are able really to go more global. 
we're still looking at the region. It's a big region yet. In the U.S., it's a mix of both. So my question here is, based on all of your experiences, have, when, when you look at investments, let's start with Khalid, when you look at investments, is, are there any specific verticals that you look at? Uh, so you want to do FinTech, you want to do this, you want to do that, healthcare, education. Do you have any area of focus? Uh, that's one. And two, if, what is your wish list? What would you love to see from the entrepreneurs in the ecosystem to bring on the table for all of us to participate and pitch in? So uh, it depends which company. I, I, I don't care whether it's B2B or B2C, by the way, mm -hmm. as long as it has a good business model. Excellent. There's nothing wrong with either or. Uh, I just look for the business model. The third one I just barely started, but I think I would love to invest more and more is, is uh, EduTech. So again, technology and education, some of it again B2B, some of it B2C, uh, which is the three areas that I think in our part of the world are very underserved, waste management, health, and education. Mm -hmm. uh, the rest is opportunistic. I have other companies, but they are opportunistic. So you look at the opportunistic approach more than a focus on specific verticals? Well, now I'm, I, I'm, I'm receiving everybody who's in health tech or in, in waste management comes to me. So okay. by virtue of having invested there, I receive more and more companies there. So I'm, I'm forced to focus there at the moment by virtue of the deal flow that's coming to me. But of course, when something else comes, I do invest in other things as well. Okay. And um, I, I would like to share something from experience. Uh, we get a lot of requests from our institutional clients, corporate family, family offices who are in the, um, in the B2B, B2B businesses, traditional businesses. They are looking to invest in technologies in the B2C uh, rather than building their own in-house, which is a bit riskier for them. To build your own in-house tech team, it will cost you a lot of money. And it's this company that goes through the trial and error, they're ready to go. So they want to invest in these technologies and integrate with their own system. So this is something that um, in Saudi Arabia is it's the case actually now. Okay. Yeah. Nicola? Yeah, uh, so to answer that, I mean, there is a Lebanese saying, you know, uh, on, on, so we are, we are more opportunistic as I am capital, I would say, uh, since we are not sector uh, specific. So we try to be uh, opportunistic and, and we, we tend, as I said, the 331 unleashed a lot of money for the tech. So there's lots of money for the tech. Uh, but what's, what about the non-tech? And there are lots of opportunities outside the non-tech. And that's, we try to, as much as we can, to look at opportunities outside the tech. Uh, so in our portfolio, we looked at a couple of agro-food uh, companies. We looked at fashion, uh, fashion designer, you know, ready to wear uh, st uh, kind of uh, high, high quality uh, stuff. We have a um, uh, furniture design, you know, as well. So. We, we, we tend to look at, at these sectors because there are no VC money available for these guys uh, outside the tech. So we try to, to look at, to cater for those industries as well. We as well co-financed a movie, by the way, for those who want to know. So yeah, so we were bold enough to go to movies and then after that we received a lot of scripts, you know, obviously, because when you go in a space, <laughs> you know, everyone, uh, everyone comes. So, but, so what we're trying to do now is, is to try to create funds, you know, that are dedicated for an industry, so an agri-food fund or a movie fund, you know, yeah, and, and there we can have a more leverage than us going uh, individually as, as, as a VC. So we, uh, as, as I am capital, you know, so we have a special mandate, different than the 331, so our money is not from 331, by the way. Uh, as I said, it's, it's from USAID. And, and so our mandate is, you know, to leverage as much as we can private sector in any, in any sector, private sector money in any sector, and to create jobs and, and, and obviously uh, create wealth that will contribute to the, to the economy of, uh, growing the economy of, of Lebanon. So health, waste management, edutech, uh, other than ICT, so movie or fashion. There's one last point I'd like to make. For us as an angel network, we don't invest in what we want. We invest in what the investors want, what they, what they look for. Okay. So meaning if Bitcoin is a hot topic now, so then we'll go and source deals from that sector. If FinTech is a hot, that, so that's our focus, is what our investors are looking to invest into, then we'll go and source the deal based on that. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're running out of time. So a final word from, from our audience, uh, from our panel, please, to the audience. 
any thoughts, any, any advice on, on how, what to do next and how to come to the angel investment uh, world? Yeah, what to do next? You go to visit our booth. I am Capital Booth. That's uh, easy. If, you're, if, if you want to become a business angel, so we can tell you how. And two, if you're a startup, you want to pitch to uh, business angels as well. As I said, we have every six weeks, you know, two investment sessions, one for uh, women only and one for uh, any, I mean, any gender. So again, you have more info on our booth. Please do not hesitate to, to visit our booth. And uh, yalla, not Lincoln. Khalid? My only thing is, is because it's still very small, uh, is to collaborate. So people like the ones sitting here and more of, the, of us in the Arab world exactly. should join forces and, and deal flows, help each other, exchange information. Uh, what the politicians has failed, have failed to do, at least we, in, we angel investors yeah. should be able to do. Yeah. I'd like to see a one ecosystem in the Arab world instead of each country is trying to do their own. Plus, everyone has to go to you to invest. That, that's get, another thing. Market, if so you're an angel investor, everyone. reach out to me or my partner, Sunil, there, and we'll invest your money. And if you're a company, come, we'll raise money for you. That's Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. Thank you.